Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to this new installment of our uh, immersive media trailblazer series. Today, uh, we have a phenomenal guest, uh, John Craig Freeman, and uh, we'll be uh, discussing with him about uh, augmented reality and, and his work and vision uh, in a second. Um, while uh, we get ready, uh, I just want to give you a few elements about the, the logistics. Uh, we're going to have a pre-form discussion uh, with um, John Craig in a second, and you can ask questions in the chat, and we'll open up for um, live kind of one-on-one -on -one questions at the end if, uh, you know, something picks your attention, and we can have an open discussion uh, in about 15, 20 minutes uh, from now. Um, I've also, also asked uh, John Craig to share with us some of his work as visual, so while we're having this conversation, you're going to see some um, images in the background of uh, uh, installations that were done by, uh, by Craig in the past. And uh, again, that might trigger some thoughts, ideas, questions. So feel free to you know, type in if, if you want to dig into something or hold your questions until the end. With that, uh, Craig, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And thanks everybody for coming. So, um, Hi, Craig, George. A, little bit, a little bit about your background. So you're, um, you're an AR artist. You're one of the uh, uh, pioneer in that space. And you're also a professor of art and technology at Emerson College um, and a research affiliate at uh, MIT uh, Open Doc Lab. Um, but in addition to that, you're also the founding member of uh, an international artist collective um, known as Manifest AR. So I think, you know, I'm sure at some point you might talk a little bit about that. Um, and, um, you know, just to get um, us started here, I just want to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about your journey as, a, as an artist, as an AR artist, and maybe share some of your, your work with us. Sure. Okay, so I'll just, I'm just going to run a slideshow in the background here uh, while we talk. I, I won't stop and refer to any particular project, but if there's questions about uh, any of these projects, we can um, uh, talk about it uh, after the formal presentation. So let me just get this going. So, um, yeah, th thank you uh, for the quest question, Nicholas. So, uh, you know, the way I think about the kind of how I came to AR, it's really, I came to AR as a public artist. I um, had a rather conventional um, art education. Well, not conventional, but I studied painting and photography and sculpture and so forth at the University of uh, uh, San Diego, California in the late 80s, in the 80s, mid 80s, I should say. Um, and th that was the time Alan Capra was uh, the chair of the department at the time. There was a lot of uh, of kind of theoretical discourse around kind of blurring the lines between art and life and uh, uh, looking for alternative modes of art uh, dissemination and maybe some hedging against the kind of uh, the influence of the art market on the kind of art that gets produced and shown. Uh, so I always kind of had that in the back of my mind. I started thinking about the idea of uh, of public art pretty early on. And so the work that I did at uh, during my uh, uh, MFA days at the University of Colorado in Boulder uh, uh, was, was uh, uh, centered around the idea of uh, using emerging technology as a way to invent new forms of public art, that art is something that should be out in the world and encountered by anybody, that it doesn't uh, necessarily have to uh, remain in a kind of rarefied uh, context in museums and galleries and that sort of thing. It's the kind of thing that you could take out into the world influenced a lot by street art and so forth. And so, um, so I've had almost three decades of, uh, of, uh, of uh, experience, you know, looking at emerging technologies and trying to figure out how uh, they might um, open up opportunities to develop new forms of art in public space. Uh, so in 2000, around 2010, when AR, uh, was, it was possible for anybody with a smartphone to be able to experience it. It, it, it was a natural for me to kind of think about uh, the, the idea of, uh, of augmented reality as a public art form and the possibilities there. And so that's kind of how I uh, 
it, uh, began using the technology. Along with, as you said, the, uh, there was a group of us uh, uh, that formed an international collective. Uh, we, we wrote a manifesto and we coined the group Manifest AR. This included Mark Skowarik, uh, Will Pappenheimer, uh, uh, Tamika Theo, uh, Lillian Hong Lee, Jeffrey Allen Road, and a number of other folks. We were kind of an international group uh, that were uh, looking at, at, uh, um, at, at what it meant to, uh, to put art, uh, virtual art in public space and the way that, uh, that our notion of public was becoming transformed uh, with these new uh, mobile technologies and uh, in, in uh, network technologies. So how was that for a starting point? Yeah, this this is awesome, and um, you know, I think as we're seeing, you know, some of the visuals here, it's probably clear to to um, everybody watching this that you're also um, using augmented reality, um, you know, as a as a way to engage the public on um, social or political topics. I'm just curious, you know, how you see the role of AR as a medium, you know, beyond the pure entertainment and, and uh, you know, the visual aspects of that AR can bring um, as, a, as a tool or as a way to uh, contribute to the social and political sphere. So that's a, you know, a, a, a a complex question. I think that, that it is the, it, it's evidence of a kind of profound cognitive change that humans are undergoing. And I'll kind of get, I'll try and put this in a nutshell, but I've been, uh, most, much of my work is kind of grounded in, um, in uh, um, a kind of theoretical framework that is, uh, kind of comes out of a group, uh, a research collective uh, uh, out of the University of Florida. That's where I uh, first began my teaching career is at the University of Florida at the, as an assistant professor where I met uh, Greg Almer, who is a theorist in this area, and there's a group that's still active today. It's called the Florida Research Ensemble. But the group is kind of looking at at uh, at um, trying to understand the current kind of condition, the uh, kind of uh, uh, the the current the emergence of a new way of uh, experiencing the world and the way people see themselves and each other in history. It, 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 it's a change. That can only be kind of um, equated to a change that happened in other times in history when oral people uh, uh, were transformed by the 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 um, the the, the uh, invention and widespread use of the technology of al alphabetic reading and writing. So that transition from oral culture to literate culture as a way of kind of extending human memory. Uh, uh, made for a pro profound change in the way that people are, uh, saw themselves in the world around them. And so the, the, uh, this group has kind of been using the, le the, the this is work being done by Jacques Derrida and Walter Ong and others uh, that found the kind of academic practice of, called grammatology, which is the history and theory of, of, uh, of reading and writing. And we know quite a bit about that. But the idea is that we could take lessons from that transition from orality uh, to literacy to make predictions about what we might expect uh, from the transition from literacy to whatever is coming next. And clearly something new is coming based on the emergence of these new widespread use of digital technology, network uh, technology and mobile technology. And so the practical example of that has very much to do with, uh, with public space itself. So, that, uh, for instance, the idea of the public square is where political discourse finds its location uh, in the era of literacy. It's the, the, the town squares where people come to protest, where they come to, to celebrate, where they come to uh, uh, craft, uh, uh, where individual identity is transformed into collective identity. So this is the site, the public square was the site of of uh, uh, the the, polit the public and political sphere, and so this is why we put monuments and memorials in public parks. It's because uh, it has to do with that with the the formation of national identity uh, and the transition from individual identity to national identity. So my, my question has been: What does a monument look like in the era of uh, 
of beyond literacy, this uh, kind of cognitive state that we are starting to experience in our everyday lives uh, that, that is making use of these new technologies as a kind of uh, uh, cybernetic extension of our own memories uh, is leading to a, a, a different way of experiencing the world. And so the, what we did, we witnessed the migration of the public sphere from the physical location, the town square, out into the out into the uh, placelessness, the everyday, everywhere but nowhere of the internet in the late 1990s. And so the question becomes like, what does a monument, what does a monument look like in this new public sphere that's completely uh, 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 distributed? The uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I kind of stopped there, but I, I pick up on some of these themes as we kind of progress. Yeah, and this, uh, actually, this is a good um, segue into into the question I'm going to ask you. So, for the past twenty five years, I think you know we, we've been collecting content, uh, digital content, and experiencing it, you know, through on screen, um, you know, on the web, and um, primarily. And now what we started to see is the emergence of virtual spaces, you know, for lack of a better term, you know, with the metaverse, with, you know, this new metaphor for digital contents that resembles more of a new, new set of dimensions that you can experience. Um, and start to emerge in all corners of our lives. And I'm wondering how you see AR uh, specifically as part of that broader uh, movement toward those, those new dimensions, those new spaces. Right, so that insight's super important because the reality is, is that this virtual space that is emerging out of this transition from literacy to uh, what Greg Ulmer has coined the term electricy, so literacy to electricy, uh, the virtual space emerges out of that kind of, uh, 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 kind of naturally and spontaneously. And the, the virtual space, the virtual world is something that we interact with all the time. It doesn't take augmented reality. It's just whenever you're trying to get a better cell phone signal or um, you know, try, trying to navigate the city using Google Maps, you're kind of engaging with this idea of this new virtual space that has, has begun to emerge. Also, another example of that is in uh, uh, the, the way that, um, um, you know, even, even in, um, in, in uh, the Ukraine right now, that the, the Freedom Square was the center of public protests in 2014, but it's now augmented with the cell phone, with Twitter and so forth, that called the Twitter revolutions. Uh, so, uh, so the virtual space is, is already here. Uh, it, 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 as an artist, I'm trying to give that virtual space form and meaning and bring people's attention to it in a way. Um, and, uh, and, and so the... Uh, the idea of the kind of moving through the city, we now kind of understand that the city is a kind of data scape. It's not just about it, its appearances, mm -hmm. everything about it, every, everybody who's ever lived and died there, every story that could be told, the histories, the, uh, you know, the flora and fauna of a given location, it's all kind of embedded uh, below the surface. It's not just about its appearance. It's kind of a, uh, uh, the world around us is, is, uh, is, is data as well as physical things, and uh, so it's only really natural that there that that um, that the virtual space is a kind of new kind of canvas that uh, that we can engage uh, in, in thinking deeper about uh, uh, the meaning of the world around us in a way. Um, the, the, and just I'll add to that a little bit about manifest AR. You know, it's also uh, it, it, the, the notion about the politics of the virtual space is something that is quite tangible, actually. Like back in 2010, we were very much interested in who was going to assert dominion over this new virtual space. And so we did uh, things like uh, created our own exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, didn't tell the curators or the directors about it. We just kind of searched, so circulated word of the exhibition uh, uh, on social media and all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of people are showing up with their cell phone looking at artwork that the curator didn't know was there. And, uh, and, and, and so the, it's not that there's not an answer to that question, but, but the whole act of, uh, of art, public art as intervention kind of raises the question as to who owns the public space itself. And so 
uh, if it, it, you know, beyond curators and directors, there's also the question of uh, like civic authorities. Like, can you get permission to do that out in the park or in even uh, uh, nation states and governments? You know, ask that those same kinds of hard questions. And there's a, po a politic to that. Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer in a way is it's these mega corporations, you know, it's like Facebook and, and, uh, and uh, the telecommunication companies that are actually asserting this dominion. It's a, just, a, you know, the, the uh, kind of gatekeeping and uh, taste making has kind of shifted in this new environment. Yeah. Which actually is, is, a, great, um, is a great point. I mean, if, you're, if you look at this new canvas, as you called it, you know, this new almost infinite real estate that's opening up for um, artists, um, you know, in addition to what you what you described as this colonization, you know, by the big corporation, you know, the Facebook of the world, what do you see as challenges for artists, um, for an artist who wants to start to utilize or you know express themselves, you you know, in this new can on this new canvas? Yeah, it's it's not just it, 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 well, there are challenges, but also. Uh, you know, it's like an invitation to engage in my mind. It's like, uh, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is this virtual space is in the process of being colonized. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the theory of electricity teaches that last time the literate uh, set out to colonize the or oral cultures, is, so it was quite a bloody affair. And uh, the, uh, and and if we, if artists and intellectuals and academics aren't engaged in inventing the new forms that will live in this virtual space that's emerging and the and the, the forms do need to be invented just like the technology needs to be invented the hardware needs to be invented, be invented. but you know uh sergey eisenstein the inventor of montage would tell us that the forms need to be invented just like the movie camera needed to be invented somehow and uh and if it's not artist and and uh and uh uh, academics and other people within the culture, it's going to be left to, uh, you know, criminals and pornographers. And so, you know, it, we kind of have to step up to engage in this new virtual space or we just left it, leave it to be colonized. This is great, great. I think these are, you know, very important kind of words of wisdom. I think you're right. I think we're at a very peculiar moment where um, you know no one has yet colonized that that space, but clearly there's a race that's opening up. And uh, I mean, certainly, I think for artists, I believe it's important to to look into the tools, the techniques that they can employ today to you know get into it and and start to familiarize themselves and kind of claim also their their own dimension, their own space within that new um, that new uh, medium that's opening up for for everybody. Um, with that, um, do you have any final um, words or thoughts, Craig, before we opening up for questions? Um, I, I'm I'm happy to field some questions, and if there's uh, specific questions about individual works, I, I give a Georgia shout out. And we're we're just looking at the augmented landscape, which was an exhibition that he curated at Salem back in uh, 2018, I believe. Did it say? Uh, and and uh, he, he's been very supportive of the kind of work we do. Also involved in the art in the Greenway. This is fossil fuel from our art uh, on augmented art on the Greenway. Uh, that was back in 2019. But I'm happy to kind of take some questions and take the conversation from there. All right, so we're just going to open it up to, to questions. So, um, you know, you can unmute yourself if you have any questions and jump in with your, your thoughts, comments, questions. There's something in the chat if somebody's moderating. Ah. I'm wondering how you, if you can talk about how you compress photogrammetry meshes. Right, that's a great question for you, uh, Craig. As you know, this is your your favorite technique here. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Elizabeth. That it's a good question, one that Nicholas and I were just discussing before we came on live here. Uh, not an easy thing to do. I, I think that uh, that. Uh, 
uh, I, I think probably the best of, uh, advice probably came from Rebecca Allen, who you might know, she's a professor at the uh, at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, and she famously made the one of the first uh, animated character movies when she did a music video for Kraftwerk back in, I don't know, or, or who, who knows, somebody may know the date, but way back when. Uh, but she was one that was adamant about the idea of artists it, uh, embracing uh, the technology with all of its flaws and uh, not trying to fake things. So, you know, that that's where I kind of start with this. I want to expose where the technology kind of breaks down and uh, and allow it to become fragmented. Like this is an example of compressed photogrammetry work here. Uh, it, I'm not trying to recreate a simulated reality where, where you would believe it as such. I'm trying to uh, uh, push the technology to the point where it starts to break and uh, embracing that aesthetic and trying to develop an aesthetic out of that. So it has its kind of roots in German expressionism, maybe you can say in a digital form, uh, but I don't try and make it perfect. I don't want people to mistake this work you know, when I'm trying to collect the stories of climate change migration at the US-Mexico border. I don't want it to be uh, mistaken as a kind of uh, uh, you know, a video game or some other form of entertainment. Uh, that, uh, that, and with that having said, that you're always, uh, you know, uh, striking a balance between, uh, you, know, you know, the quality and its ability to be able to, to download to a phone. And, uh, you know, augmented reality has always been within parameters. I always think that parameters are kind of good for artists in a way, you know, and a lot can be done, you know, even in the early days of some of, some of the most powerful work with my uh, uh, colleagues at Manifest AR was done with uh, much less capabilities that are than are uh, available to us today. Uh, the phones were simply way slower, the, the, the mobile connections were way slower, but you can still do some, um, uh, the, you know, we were able to do some pretty powerful work, I hope, you know, uh, just, just when we take seriously the way that meaning can be constructed with this new technology. And this again is lessons from, uh, uh, the people, uh, the avant-garde uh, 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 filmmakers, uh, Sergei Eisenstein, Vertov, and uh, and Hans Richter in the uh, early 20th century that were experimenting with the emerging uh, technologies of their time and trying to uh, uh, figure out how this technology is capable of constructing meaning in a different way. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I have a polygon budget that I try and shoot for. Uh, I do the rapid prototype typing in virtual reality because it's a little bit more flexible, but you know, there's just a certain um, uh, kind of limit that if you go beyond, you're gonna make your phone catch on fire, or you're gonna burn the batteries out or people just won't be able to see it. And so trying to strike it, it's not just the meshes too, it's also the file textures to kind of make things uh, photorealistic. Is that a good answer to the question, Elizabeth? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, just one question: What is your poly polygon budget? Is it Walmart or is it exclusive to Holt Renfrew? <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that. I don't want to give the bad impressions. You know, I push things up to a million polygons, but like you shouldn't. Like, <laughs> like uh, um, the the you know, hundred thousand polygons is is it seems excessive in a way. Uh, uh, the, but it's possible to push them as high as a million, but you're really limiting uh, what you're able to do with a project like that. Uh, many cases, uh, you know, sometimes I design projects that are specifically for any, you know, it's kind of the everywhere with the uh, where spelled W-A-R-E, uh, you know, that you can uh, take this experience of being in the, uh, the wet market of Wuhan anywhere in the, in, in experience at anywhere in the world as compared to the site specificity that uh, Manifest AR was most interested in uh, using uh, very specific sites at GPS locations. Uh, the, uh, and so if you want everybody in the, in the world to be able to see it on their phones, uh, then you're not gonna be uh, pushing the poly count up too high. But if you're doing a special exhibition where you're, you're providing the iPads for people to engage with them, then you know exactly what you can kind of get away with. And actually, for those of you who are interested to see some of John's work, actually, I see that you've added a, a QR code to one of the pieces. So while you know we're having the conversation, you, you may you can scan this and stand up and find an open space around you, and you get to experience some of some of uh, Craig's work. Um, 
George, I think, has a question. George, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Um, Craig, um, great talk. Um, but you, you, I know you over time, you focused all of this on the concept of public space and public art. Um, and while I've done quite a bit of that, um, I've also done a couple just in-house gallery exhibitions of AR. Um, and I'm wondering, do you see a distinction like I do between what we call, what we call the private space of the gallery that is self-selecting and who comes in it. It's not, it's not that it, it doesn't let anyone into it, but that a certain number of people, they're the people who go to a gallery as opposed to be walking down the street and all of a sudden come across something. Um, and I'm wondering how you, how you approach the private space of a gallery. Yeah, th thank you, George. I think it's a really good and, and actually relevant question, I, I think, to this group in a way, because I, I, I've, uh, you know, there's a bit of a rebel in me that was trying to, to, to kill the institution when I was younger and stuff. And, you know, that we, we didn't need museums and galleries and stuff. And I, of course, that's nonsense. I think that, uh, but one of the things that did happen in 2010 was it was kind of a you know, as artists, we kind of understood that this technology is forcing us to change and what we do, you know, it's, it's forcing that the, what we uh, do as artists and how to think about that differently. And it took a while for institution, I have to say, George, you were one of the art curators that kind of recognized early on that that same challenge is now laid down to, uh, muse, you know, the institutions, the museum directors, Gallery curators are starting to understand now that this technology is causing them to think differently about what they do. So I, I have not that I, I think I showed some examples. I've done work with major museums that, that I showed the example that Will and I did. We were invited to augment the uh, one of uh, LACMA's blockbuster, you know, exhibitions of uh, uh, the Hans Richter uh, retrospective, and the curator kind of understood that we were kind of picking up where. Richter and his colleagues had kind of left off in the 20th century looking at the emerging technology of our time. They invited us in and we were part of a major museum exhibition. And of course, uh, uh, George invited us to our first kind of formal exhibition at a museum, which was at the ICA uh, during uh, George's Cyber Arts Festival. So I think that this idea of uh, museum administrators, public uh, uh, space uh, administrators, we're all kind of in this together, that things are kind of changing. We need to think of differently about you know, the role that art plays there. And I think that certainly I've done a lot of projects that would use the gallery as a kind of central hub where people learn how to access the work on their phone and you know download whatever application that they need to be. And then there's some kind of mapping system within the exhibition and you send them out into the neighborhood uh, with their phones to kind of go on a self-guided tour. Uh, it, and I also just think that there's a place, frankly, for augmented reality in, in, in a conventional uh, um, it, it exhibition. Uh, I think it, it, it's, uh, um, it, I think it's great. And I, I don't think it's just augmented reality. Again, it has to do with the emergence of electricity that there's also this whole, the, you know, the kind of uh, 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 crypto, it, you know, uh, billionaire uh, kind of meme nonsense is kind of forcing the, uh, the, a difference in the way that the art market works. Everybody's kind of trying to, you know, jump on in, NFTs and so forth, non-fungible non tokens. Uh, it, and it dis it disrupts the way institutions function. And, and you know, that same disruption occurs occurred during the uh, transition from orality into literacy. Of course, you know, the kind of uh, religious ritual gets replaced by schooling in the university as it, you know, so there had to be new institutions or old institutions needed to change. And that's the kind of value of a kind of electric uh, theory. Uh, but uh, uh, George, did that answer the question or would it, I feel like I'm just kind of blithering, sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's, very, that's very smart, Craig. Um, and, but I, I, I just take it one step further. By its very nature, AR, because you have to pick up a device and turn it on and look and know where to look. Um, by very nature, it has some of the aspects of the private art in an art gallery, um, it, even though it's in the middle of Central Park. Um, there, I know there are artworks in Central Park, AR artworks that I, I can't see, and I don't know where they are, um, but I know they're there. Um, and so 
there's this concept of private versus public, of um, the art for the cognoscenti versus the art that you bump into as you're walking down the street. Um, as it seems to me it hasn't been answered yet for AR, and I'm, I, I don't expect you to provide the answer, but I do, I do think it's a very interesting question that we're all dealing with. Yeah, I, I think uh, the uh, uh, it, it's it's uh, again a super important point that you're making, George. I think that the uh, uh, and to go back to the early days of manifest, they are there was this way, this whole way that our activities, first of all, were interventionist by their nature. The idea was to go in and intervene in public discourse. And and the problem there, of course, you know, it's not like street art where you're just like it, you're you're um, you just come across it. You kind of have to know. And the way we dealt with that was that there was a complete integration with social media back before social media became such a problematic thing. But you know, you you the, the, a project a manifest they are project had to have a presence in social media. Otherwise, if people don't know about it, it just simply doesn't exist. And uh, and and so you know, we saw. A, a kind of fluid uh, connection between the augmented reality art and other forms of social media. It all existed in, within the context of the virtual space and could be leveraged and, in, in, and intervened in. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and, and the, yeah, and, and so, so I, I guess that's mostly what I have to say about that. I, I, Seems like I had one more point just about not knowing it's there. Yeah, but but, but that's good. <laughs> that's we have actually talking. another question to chat. I yeah. think is is a good um, kind of follow up uh, point. Um, Amelia, do you want to jump in? Yeah, was, I've been trying to read that, Amelia. But if you just oh yeah, sorry, ask that's, it, just a, <laughs> that's just an essay I wrote in the chat. Um, <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank um, you. But I'm uh, I'm just very curious, and as you know, uh, you know. I, we've been talking outside of, of, of obviously this space about a project, but I'm very curious as to how, um, particularly when you um, do work with um, communities or um, people who are kind of trying to make a strong like justice and equity based point or, and or kind of using this kind of work to um, represent themselves in a particular kind of way um in a way that they would like to be permanent or at least indefinite um how how so it's not a temporary um installation or intervention and the material that they're providing or that they're um bringing in sorry my dog fuck it um or how how do they keep like how does that how can it be sustained so that it's not something that is you know available for a period of time and then goes away how can the community have control over that. I hope you can, I'm gonna mute myself because my dog won't stop, but I hope you understood the question. <laughs> I, I, I think I did, Amelia, I think it brings up a very important point because uh, uh, as uh, Nicholas had said, I've been invited to become a research affiliate at MIT and one of the big projects they uh, have at the Open Documentary Lab is the co-creation studio where they're taking on these very important issues about representation and how uh, the politics of representation have changed since the uh, uh, racial awakening with after George Floyd and so forth and the Trump administration and so forth. The, and the idea of the indignity of speaking for others when you try and speak for others as an artist, as a documentarian, a lot of the work I do is documentary in nature, uh, is it necessarily, uh, it, it's, it's indignant because it assumes that those people don't have a voice for themselves. And so, um, so one and 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 let me finish prefacing this just by saying that Manifest AR um, succeeded because there was an application. There was a couple applications, but the most important one was was an application that came out of Europe uh, called Layer, and it, it it was simply an augmented reality browser. So you think of it like a web browser, but it was a way of viewing augmented reality content uh, out in the real world, and they. They took care of keeping the application up to date and for making sure that it ran both on, um, on, uh, on iPhone and on Android. And it allowed us as artists to kind of focus on the work itself and to be able to work, not collaboratively, we work collectively. We take a place or a topic or uh, a, an incident and we would all respond separately, but all in the same place using uh, an off the shelf augmented reality browser. 
Now, when um, and just quickly to say, when uh, Apple and and Google became interested in this technology, we talk a lot about why they became interested. But the first thing they did was they went out and kind of destroyed any kind of uh, startup or open source source uh, version of this sort of thing. And uh, and uh, there was a time when, as artists, you had to become a develop an app developer, and uh, and and you had to fight with the review boards. Because so this is a question of who search asserts dominion. If you put if you choose to play in Apple's um, uh, ecosystem, then and you're trying to make an app, then you have to teach their review board art history to explain what it is you're doing. And then you have to keep the thing up to date every six months and it just becomes impossible. Now, this is the role that uh, I know we're not, not trying to plug Hoverlay here, but this is the role uh, that uh, uh, Milan and Nicholas have stepped up and Hoverlay is a really wonderful application uh, for this. And what I found importantly, and I think that this probably speaks to the work that you're trying to do, Amelia, is I don't need to be the artist uh, for a community that wants to speak for themselves. You know, I can come in in an advising role and within an hour, I can have individuals producing their own content in their own places and learning how to tell their own stories with this technology because uh, there's something like Hoverlay out there to use that uh, those communities don't need to become artists necessarily even. Uh, they, they can focus on their own expertise with the stories that they have to, to tell. Uh, they don't have to become app developers. So it becomes a really flexible way, uh, a kind of flexible solution to this notion of co-creation and decentralizing and, de and uh, disseminating the means of representation to the people that deserve most to tell the stories. Um, uh, the longevity of it, I think, is uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, everything's ephemeral, you know, all of the sculptures even rust at some point, you know, the, uh, um, we're at a time when uh, everything's cheap in a way, you know, things just come and go, nobody's keeping track of it. Um, you know, I found myself uh, in, in possession of really important stories that have come to have historic significance and they're only able to be seen on legacy equipment that I saved at the time. Uh, that why is there, you know, uh, at at risk of uh, of, uh, of uh, you know just becoming inaccessible and going away? Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, but I don't know. Can you follow you know, up? Point, uh, on on yeah. the point of uh, longevity, there is uh, there is some interesting discussion that, that may be you know subject for another session that we're going to have in the future, but around standard uh what would be a way to capture in a you know uh future safe uh format you know human readable uh machine readable uh based on open formats like you know mpeg4 gltf or the things that we think are here to stay so that we can preserve you know not just you know bits and pieces of the digital elements but also how they manifest themselves in augmented reality, how they connect to markers and whatever, you know, locations and so on. So I think if that's of interest, I think just stay tuned because I think we may have um, some interesting discussion around that topic and maybe an opportunity to bring together artists to formalize a format of some sort that we would be happy to, you know, support that would, that would guarantee some level of transparency and, and uh, independence from any kind of stack. In the future, um, yep. the, I was just going to add. It would take too long to unpack here, but I think that there's that that there there once we uh, once the NFT craze goes bust, I think that there's going to be that technology is going to be useful in terms of yeah. uh, institutional collecting of artwork, right? Because if we can solve the problem with uh, uh, making digital art collectible you know, for the first time, if we could solve that problem for artwork, we might be able to start saving all of the other. Uh, you know, collective knowledge of the human, you know, as we upload everything into the cloud or something, everything's digital. Nobody's thinking about how it stays, stays around for any time. Uh, can I respond to Eric's question here? It's a really good one. It, uh, do you want to ask that question out loud, Eric? Uh, the, it, what Eric is asking about the, he said it was mentioned that earlier that our environment already has a flow of data 
And are there artists working uh, to reveal this uh, flow of information data that is all around us? I kind of think that that's a little bit about what I'm doing in a way. Uh, George probably has some thoughts about it as well because he's worked with artists like this. I think a lot of the Manifest AR group was uh, interested in this idea of kind of data scape. But I think that there's a lot of work that's being done by digital artists with, with uh, uh, kind of database art as well that it will start integrating itself into AR as the, uh, as uh, uh, yeah, Rafik uh, and I'll do, it's a, a very good uh, 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 answer, Kristen. Thank you. Yeah, uh, look, look up his work if you're not familiar with it. But uh, but yeah, I think that that that, um, that the possibilities are quite endless. Uh, the the Florida Research Ensemble kind of that uh, has adopted this kind of metaphor for approaching space as a subject matter. Uh, called uh, choreography. And again, it takes a bit to unpack, but the ancient Greeks had this idea. It's a name for place, but it's not just, again, it's not just physical appearances. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the idea is that any individual place has everything embedded in it there. And it's just a matter of uh, a reveal. It needs, it, it's there to be revealed. And so that's the way I approach uh, augmented reality. It's kind of the if you think of the uh, ter terroir, terroir uh, as Nick was about this, the French uh, pronunciation of this kind of regarding of a vineyard, uh, not just of the particular grape, because you could take that same grape and plant it somewhere else. It's not going to produce the same wine. It has everything that goes into it, the climate, the, the soil, the people who've worked it, how long the, the vines have been there, all kind of are, it is kind of an, it has a kind of emergent quality uh, that this technology uh uh, when, when you use this technology in that way, it has the potential of kind of allowing all of the kind of subtleties and complexity to kind of emerge uh, that goes against kind of, uh, uh, that, that offers an alternative to kind of literate instrumental reason where problems are kind of divided up into all of their uh, individual components and then kind of unpack that way. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, this kind of idea of a data scape where everything's there all at the time, all at once. It's something that artists should be trying to tap into, I think. Um, Craig. Yeah. Um, just, I wasn't planning on doing this, but since the subject has come up, I'm gonna um, blow our own horn for a little bit. Uh, the next show at the Boston Cyber Arts Gallery is called Data Draws Data. And it's the work of the Barabasi Labs at, um, at uh, Northeastern University where they take vast quantities of data and create beautiful objects, not as art, but as abilities to read the data and make sense of it, but they become beautiful and they become artworks um, by their very nature. And I think it's a very interesting show that everyone will find fascinating. And there'll be video, two-dimensional and three-dimensional data representations there. And are you guys doing anything online? So, because I know we have a pretty national uh, group of participants today. We'll, there... we'll, we'll definitely we'll definitely have on our website uh, as much information as we can get up there. Um, yeah, and that's the Boston Cyber Art Gallery for everybody who's not in Boston, because uh, I, I recognize some names of people that are all over the country. So, and it, and it'll open next Friday. Thanks, George. That's that's great. Can you put a link? Yes, I think uh, George, if you could put the link to the, uh, the gallery in the chat, that would be awesome. All right, any any additional question? I don't. I think we've answered everything in the chat, but feel free to jump in otherwise directly. And we are recording this. Yes, so. Um, you will all get the, the recording and uh, feel free obviously to share it and uh, reach out to um, you know, John Craig Freeman and myself if you have any thoughts, questions, or um, wanna continue the conversation. So with that, I just really wanna thank you, Craig. This was really fascinating and thought provoking. I think the visuals also you know, just kept everybody just you know, fascinated by your work. So, I hope we get to see more of what you're doing in the near future. And, uh, you know, I just want to, again, thank you and thank everybody for participating uh, to this uh, event. Thanks. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm, I'm pretty easy to get in touch with if I can do anything for anybody.
And uh, uh, I just love this, this level of conversation. It's wonderful and important, I think. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.